but the press of events forced the other less discussed parts to proceed immediately. On June 10th, Congress decided to form a committee to draft a Declaration of Independence in case the resolution should pass. The following day, John Adams, Thomas Jefferson, Benjamin Franklin, Roger Sherman, and Robert R. Livingston were appointed as the committee of five to accomplish this. That same day, Congress decided to establish two other committees to develop the resolution's last two parts. The following day, another committee of five, John Dickinson, Benjamin Franklin, John Adams, Benjamin Harrison V, and Robert Morris, was established to prepare a plan of treaties to be proposed to foreign powers. A third committee was created, consisting of one member from each colony to prepare a draft of a constitution for confederation of the states. The committee appointed to prepare a plan of uh, treaties made its first report on July 18th, largely in the writing of John Adams. A limited printing of the document was authorized, and it was received and uh, amended by Congress over the next five weeks. On August 27th, the amended plan of uh, treaties was referred back to the committee to develop inst instructions concerning the amendments, and Richard Henry Lee and James Wilson were added to the committee. Two days later, the committee was empowered to prepare further instructions and report back to Congress. The formal version of the plan of treaties was adopted on, seven, on September 17th. On September 24th, Congress approved negotiating instructions for commissioners to obtain a treaty with France based on the template provided in the plan of treaties. The next day, Benjamin Franklin, uh, Silas Dean, and Thomas Jefferson were elected commissioners to the Court of France. Uh, alliance with France was considered vital if the war with Britain was to be won and the newly declared uh, country was to survive. The committee drafting a plan also after that war, we owed France $7 million for helping us. $7 million. That's $7 million in that day's money. So under the Articles of Confederation, this is why we went for 11 years. It wasn't working. It was a problem. And some of our founding fathers said, look, if we don't straighten this thing out, what's going to happen is we're just going to be subjects under another king. If we don't pay France, they're going to come and they're going to take us. And so that needed to be dealt with. That's partly uh, what uh, Hamilton was talking about when he became the first Secretary of the Treasury. And he wrote the 93-page document on uh, manufacturing. That was part of his thing is he wanted the government to actually uh, decide the winners and losers and actually set manufacturing up, decide how that needed to be done because he also worried about that seven million dollars that had to go back to France and the federal government could only collect uh, 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 money on foreign imports that, and that's what was supposed to sustain the federal government. So there was a b debate over that. The committee drafting a plan of, con uh, of confederation was chaired by John Dickinson. They uh, presented their initial results to Congress on July 12th, 1776. Long debates followed on such issues as sovereignty, the exact powers to be given the Confederate government, whether to have a judiciary and voting procedures. The final draft of the Articles of Confederation was prepared during the summer of 1777 and approved by Congress for ratification by the uh, individual states on November 15th of 1777. After a year of debate, it continued in, in use from that time onward, although it was not ratified by all states until almost four years later on March 1st, 1781. So we went from 1781 to 1787 from the ratification of the Articles of Confederation, even though the other states had drawn it up in this Continental Congress, to actually setting up the Constitution of the United States, getting it ratified, and setting up the Congress of the United States. So chronological account, this is the American history that led us <clears throat> up to some of the greatest documents ever written by man less the Bible, in my estimation. That's my opinion. The French and Indian War from 1754 to 1763, the Royal Proclamation Line, 
1763, Pontiac's Rebellion of 1763, the Sugar Act and Stamp Act of 1764 to 1765, the, the Declaratory Act of 1766, the Townsend Acts of 1767 to 1768, the Boston Massacre of 1770, Committees of Correspondence 1772, Boston Tea Party of 1773, the Intolerable Acts or the Coercive Acts of 1774, the First Continental Congress of 1774, the American Revolutionary War of 1775, remember started as a civil war, and then the Lee Resolution of July 2nd, 1776. So it was a civil war until July 2nd under the Lee Resolution when the people were no longer British citizens, but free and independent citizens of the Americas. Any questions? Any comments or concerns? That history is extremely important to understand and understand how that fits into the ancient history that we, that we studied. The 1100s Charter of Liberty through the Magna Carta 1215, through the Petition of Right of 1628, the Grand Remonstrance of 1641, and the British Bill of Rights of 1689. Now remember last week I told you to pay uh, very close attention to the British Bill of Rights of 1689, because when we get into the Declaration of Independence and we get into that portion of it that were the grievances, all of those grievances take this history and that uh, protection of those rights and it, overlay, and it overlays them. And that's where those complaints came from. That's where those grievances came from. They're in the Declaration of Independence. And I would urge everyone and anyone memorize the preamble to the Declaration of Independence. Memorize it. It seems like something really silly. But when you memorize that thing, that really is the very essence of the principles of this country. It's the essence of it. Uh, Lincoln said it, it was the, that the Declaration of Independence, or that the Constitution was the apple of gold in the frame of silver. The frame of silver he's talking about is the Declaration of Independence. It sets up the very principles that the Constitution codifies in articles. And it's extremely important because in today's age, we try to make it that, oh, you can't understand this legislation. It's all so, ooh, it takes a legal scholar to figure it out. No, it doesn't. It just takes the average person that understands the difference between right and wrong to figure it out. And it's all right there in the Declaration of Independence. The more you know it <coughs> by memorizing it, I'll tell you what, it will make your life uh, far richer when you start seeing things. You can point to different parts in that and say, oh, wait a minute. That violates those principles. And when it violates those principles, you can find it in the Constitution where they're breaking the Constitution. Just like this week, in, at the end of last week and this week, when they were trying to drag me to a foreign court in our own state court administrator's office, elected judges and court staff had no clue that that was against the Constitution, both of the state and the federal. That blew my mind. I should not be the one telling them that that violated the Constitution. They should have known that. But if I didn't know my rights or be able to push that, who was going to defend my rights? Who? No one. I was the only one there to do it. Go ahead. Yeah. Whoever else it was, she said. It's like I'm sitting there watching it with my mouth mm -hmm. stopped open. I was like, Yeah, she's wanting to know if I contacted everybody involved in the case. I'm sorry, I'm being sued individual. That's not my duty or responsibility. That's the court's duty and responsibility, not mine. And there was a bunch of people that showed up for court this morning because the courts hadn't notified anybody of what I knew on Friday afternoon. Somehow it was incumbent on me to let everybody know. 
Not my, to, to quote uh, Freddie Prince, not my yob, man. Not my yob. So. <laughs> so are there any other questions, comments, concerns? Lots of them. <laughs> Lots of them, yes. Uh, uh, what's next week, Jason? What's on the schedule for next week? Patrick Henry. Patrick Henry's Give Me Liberty or Give Me Death speech. Very, very important, especially after hearing this, this history. There was a lot of Tories that were, well, we're British citizens and the king will be nice to us. We just have to, we just have to uh, 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 petition him and, and, and have him uh, uh, give his favor on us. And one of the parts of his speech were these ships that they're sending to our shores are not ships of love. They're not coming here with ships full of troops to open their arms and hug us. This is war. Know it for what it is. He said, you peaceful men will sit by and justify all of this all the way through until you're slaves. They're not sending ships full of men here to hug us and, and give us a warm welcome. They are ships of war. So. It's going to be a very interesting, I know you've heard probably parts of the speech, but with this history that you now have in hearing that speech, trust me, that speech becomes much richer to you.